Okay, just wanna make sure everyone can still uh, hear me. Is that good? Everyone hears me clearly? Good, five by five. Okay, great. So we're gonna get started now. We're in the middle of chapter 12 of uh, Sefer Malachim Aleph. And um, what I'm gonna share with everyone uh, as we continue in chapter 12 is of course, today we're gonna parse one of the more challenging, I think one of the more challenging aspects of the story uh, of what happens in Malachim Aleph, namely the reality that somehow, for some reason that we will not fully understand even at the end of today, Yeravim ben Nevat decides to build two golden calves. A child who's eight years old, five years old, who goes to nursery school, already came home, Parshat Kitisa, and drew a picture of the Jewish people dancing around the golden calf. And then Moshe Rabbeinu smashing the Luchot, and uh, all of Jewish history flashing before our eyes. But somehow you open up chapter 12. I'm on page, uh, for those who are in the Korentana, page 422 on the bottom. And we saw last, we learned that uh, Rechavam sends around a tax collector and it ends very badly. He's killed in a very um, graphic way, i.e. through Skila. And it's all the Jewish people, as if every single person like threw a rock on it here, everyone participate in this uh, mass killing of this person. In other words, everyone's going to participate in killing him. Everyone has a hand in it. Very um, unceremoniously, they coronate him. He's the king. And Rechavam has to run back to Yerushalayim, right? Then we saw page, top page 423. I'm in Malachim Aleph, chapter 12, verses 23, 24. Uh, 22, 23, 24, this Navi named Shemaya, who has no safer in Tanakh, speaks to Klal Yisrael uh, in, in, in terms of in Malchut Yehuda, don't touch, just leave them go, yeah? Now, after that, that they, 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 they stand down and we see that they'd actually mustered 180,000 troops from Shevet Yehuda. Now we get to the next section, which is important for us to understand uh, from the perspective of geography. Pasuk Chavhei, Vayiven Yerav Am et Shechem, Behar Ephraim, Vayeshev Ba, Vayetze Misham, Vayiven et Penuel. So he goes to Shechem, which is in Har Ephraim. Yerav Am ben Nevat is from Shevet Ephraim. So he goes to Har Ephraim, and that's his new area of capital city, maybe. He builds it. And then he leaves there and goes to Penuel. And we saw last we learned, we talked about where Penuel is. Now the kingdom will go back to the house of David. Right? I can't let them go back. They're just going to go back to Yerushalayim. That's the rallying place. They'll kill me, and they'll put Rechavam. They'll install him as the king over everyone. He takes counsel. King Yeravam takes counsel, just like Rechavam earlier took counsel. Now Yeravam gets counsel from his counselors. And what is that counsel? Yisrael. Asher he'elucha me'eretz Mitzrayim. Just on the level of Pshat, our, our, our reading at first blush is shocking. He makes two golden calves, and he says to them, it's uh, too much for you to go to Yerushalayim. Behold, English literalist translation, behold, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What, do you think they were idiots? They're going to believe that? These are not primitive slaves who just emerge. You can make excuses and explanations they just got out of Egypt, they, they suffered, they, they, they had a PTSD, whatever language you're going to use. So they, they sort of believed it. People foolishly thought something. Now with all the history, it's 480 years later. It's not the same people. It's not the grandchildren, it's not the great-grandchildren. We're talking about Dore Dor, 500 years almost. So how were they supposed to accept this? Where is Dan? We'll see in a minute. It's in the north. So they uh, this was a, was a, obviously a, a sin. 
And the people uh, went all the way up to Dan to, uh, to, to, to have their worship center. Vayas et Beit Bamot, Vayas Kohani Miktsota Am Hayubi Bnei Levi. So this is like another sin. I don't know. I, I got off the ride already at Avodah Zara. But now instead, it's just like, by the way, they made a special house of Bamot. A Bama is after all a form of an altar. They built a house of them, means a, a, a group of them, a campus for them. And they made Kohanim from the edges of the nation. These were not from Bnei Levi. That's not your biggest problem, you would think, but mentioning it. A new holiday is born. It's a month after the holiday of Tishrei. It's in the month of Marcheshvan, the same day of the month. He's Makpid, the 15th is an important day. 15th of the month of Nisan, 15th of the month of um, Tishrei, 15th of Nisan, Pesach. The other one is Sukkot. He made an extra one, extra holiday, right? Just like the festival that it takes place in Yehuda, i.e. in the 15th month, that's called Chag. He made another Sukkot, an exact month later. Why? We'll come back to it. He goes up on the Mizbeach uh, th- th- that he had made in Beit El, and there he's offering, it seems to say, Lizabeach la'agalim ashe'ase, he's offering offerings to these calves, that's what it sounds like. And he put one in Beit El. What did he put in Beit El? The Kohanei Abamot Asher Asa, the high, the priests of uh, 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 that, that he put uh, up for the high places. Kohanei Abamot, he called them the the high place uh, uh, priests. Vayal Mizbech Asher Sab Beit El Chamisha Sar Yom Bachodesh Hashmini Bachodesh Sher Bada Milibo from the month that he picked out of his head. He, 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 that's what it means. It emerged from his heart. He made it up. He made it up. All right? Sher bada milibo means it's it's a fiction. He made it up. And he went up to the Mizbech in order to be mocked. It means to offer offerings. And the reason why it's harping on that, we'll say for now, working premise, which we'll get to next time we learn, will be in chapter 13, where some prophet will come to speak with him while he's up there and have a conversation with him. But we really need to unpack what this is about because on the face of it, it sounds pretty terrible and horrific. Can I just, Shelly, before I take any questions, I'd like to show everyone the map. Um, those who are in person can look on the screen right next to us, right here, yeah? So you see this here, right? Here's the map. Can you see it clearly? Best as I can with my eyes. Sorry, you want to sit closer? You might as well. We're going to do a lot on the screen today. So I'll, I'll magnify it yet, yet further. Where am I? I went... Everyone, don't get dizzy. Don't get dizzy. Where's the map? I lost it already. It was here just a minute ago. Hey, Fouze, did I erase it? No, it's here. So here we are. He, he, he made his capital city in Shechem. He went over the border to Penuel. He set up a worship center in Beit El. And then you can go there today. He went to Dan. You can go to Dan today. We know there's an ancient city in Dan. It's called tail done. A tail means a heap, a heap of something that was old, ancient, usually ancient ruins. Hence the expression tail aviv. It's supposed to be old, the old new city. That's what tail aviv means, right? The, the old spring. It's, you know, it's both a tail and it's aviv. It's both. Tail done. The heap at Dan. This is the biblical Dan. Today it is the place. It's a uh the the um Reshet, uh, you know, for uh, for Teva in Eretz Israel, they maintain this place called Tel Dan. It's a, it's like a nature preserve. Uh, I was there in 2017, not in Tel Dan itself, but in the surrounding environs, the Golan Heights, right here, Kiryat Shmona, around uh, here, where the word Laish is, something like that, and that's Lebanon already. That's right at the border, Tel Dan. Yeah. So that's quite a spread. I'm, I'm zooming out. You can see the whole thing, yeah? It's quite a spread. He set up all these different things. So we already talked about last time that, of course, the name of the place, Pinuel, is very significant for us, right? Pinuel is the place where Yaakov Avinu, when he returned from exile, went to that place in order to, uh, uh, well, n- not in order to. It was named because of his uh, uh, wrestling with an angel. 
Remember? At the end of it, the place is called Peniel, Penuel. That's here. Yerovam ben Nevad is Makpi to go here. And he sets up something here and something here and then something down here. It's like a triangle. Down in Beit El, we'll come to it in a minute. Shechem, what's Shechem? We saw that also. First place that when he returns, Yaakov Avinu is given that place. He buys that place rather, but that's also the place where he sets up in Mizbeach for Hashem. Geographically, it's at the center of the country, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then he goes to Beit El. Why Beit El? And we want to venture hazard a guess what, what's so significant about Beit El? Can you think of something in history about Beit El? Isn't Beit El um, where uh, it, when Yaakov goes out to the country to go up to Lavan, doesn't he? Exactly, stop exactly, exactly. That's where he goes when he uh, exactly what happens when he goes up to when he's leaving town, so to speak. It's not just that he goes there, but something happens there. Do you remember? The ladder. The yeah, the dream with the ladder. And, and what is he saying after the dream with the ladder? Oh my goodness. Right? I didn't know God, I didn't know God was here. I didn't here. know. Yeah, it's more than that. I didn't know God's presence was here, but it's more than that. Chapter 28, Sefer Bray Sheet. I should have put this on the source sheet for everyone to look up, but page 31 in the Quran Tanakh, Bray Sheet, chapter 28, verse 10. Gets to the place, etc., etc., etc. You turn to the next page, page 32, and I'm using this uh, version of the Quran Tanakh, but you're welcome to use your Tanakh. Breshi, chapter 28, verse 17. Oh, sorry, verse 16. How awesome is this place? Ein zekim beit elokim. Now, according to Chazal, Beit El is Yerushalayim. He stopped off in Yerushalayim. If you look on the map, of course, there's a great prox geographic proximity between these two things, these two places, right? Yerushalayim to Beit El. Other alternate, alternatively, and, and why was it called Beit El, not Yerushalayim? Because Beit El means the house of God. Anywhere that you had an encounter with Hashem, we call Beit El. And this Beit El is not the same. Others argue, no. Of course, there's a Beit El, and there was a ladder. Remember, we talk about how the Rosh Shipu'o, the head of the, of the ladder, is in Yerushalayim, and there's all these descriptions about, so the feet of it are in Beersheba, and the height of it is in Yerushalayim, it passes through Beit El. There's a geographic problem with that, remember? Or maybe Yerushalayim's in the middle, and then Beit El is at the end of it, and that's the highest point. In other words, there's something significant about this place, Beit El, and according to some of Farshim, it's the one you see on your screen. It's this one, north of Yerushalayim. It's a separate place. Because some argue, no, Beit El is not a generic name, like the house of God, wherever it might be. He called it Beit El. He could have called it Yerushalayim. Why didn't he call it Yerushalayim? This one's actually Yerushalayim. There's no Yerushalayim. He had in mind Yerushalayim. That's why I have all these beautiful midrashim that they counted the place and they counted Yerushalayim, right? But then the whole of Eretz, he saw like folded under him. There's a beautiful midrashim, right? Now, literally, well, literally, I don't know if it means Hashem folded it like origami, but, but it might mean that when I'm sleeping anywhere in Eretz Yisrael and I put my head down on the ground, am I not connected to all of the ground? Not just the part under my head. I'm connected to every part of the geography, no? I lay my head down upon the world, you could say. But no, the Medrash describes it's all of Eretz Yisrael. Shem was mit kapel, all of Eretz Yisrael underneath uh, Yaakov Inu. You understand? But the point is, at least in the viewpoint of Yerav and Ben Nevat, wouldn't this be a, a plum location? Why is he harking back? One, two, three locations, um, three on three, relate to Yaakov Avinu. And at least one of them is pretty significantly related to Yosef. Yeah? Yeah. And to Ephraim, whose Nachla is this area right here. Right? Nachla here. Where else is the Nachla of, uh, of um, Ephraim? Nowhere else. But what about Menashe? Menashe is located um, both on the West Bank yeah. and on the East Bank. Remember? Chatsi right. Shevet Menashe is going to leave. So how did that happen? Well, very simply. Because if you have Shechem, you have the area over here, Menashe territory, 
And then over here, Menashe territory, well, that, that cinches that, don't you think? Which of course begs the question, and that's going to be a bit of a mystery for us, why did he go all the way as far as Dan and put a worship center here? Why didn't he put it you know, farther south? What was it about the north that was more attractive to him um, uh, that, that want, made him want to do that? There's, there, there's clearly some logic behind it. We'll have to come back to that. But we need to try to unpack what's going on here. And first, we need to uh, see the Gemara, which I put on the screen here. Hope everyone at home can see it too. It's the Gemara in Masachat Sanhedrin. Masachat Sanhedrin Dav Kufalaf, with the English just uh, just under uh, underneath it. Yeah. So, Amar Rav Nachman. Oh wait, Shell, you had a question. I'm sorry, I forgot to take your question. Apologies. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, it didn't strike me when we started to do this uh, last week, but now it's just like a ton of bricks on me. Um, he's a, Yeravam is afraid of being killed. I was wondering, what's he afraid of being killed for? Yeah, the kingdom might go back. He's afraid of being killed because the people were a loose cannon and stoned the tax collector. It doesn't say he told them to stone Yeravam's tax Excellent collector. point. Excellent. The people are, are a loose cannon, and when they decide we're going to go back to the house of, uh, of David, they'll kill him. Fickle. Yeah, so, I mean, he's, he's, he's in a sense between a rock and a hard place. He's got oh, for sure. a telling, telling him, uh, God is giving you this for a while, but you have to follow what God wants you to do. And he's thinking, oh, boy, if I do that, uh, they're going to be killing me. Excellent. So I've got to come up with a strategy and the calves, well, I can maybe, uh, I can, I can somewhat make the calves look like they're not really calves in idol worship. You know, I can yeah. sort of put them along there. Again, but it's, it still does beg the question, don't you think? Like, could he have not thought of something that would be less obvious to tip off the Jewish people? Like, we don't do this. Like, he seemed, like, it just seems like folly. It just seems like ridiculous so if you, you look mean, at the gemara here someone else sorry no no you you, you mean like he he makes up a, uh, a phony holiday which would be a time no like no i mean like why did he choose golden calves it just seems so it's like of all the things to do but you're saying he should have done something like with the holiday pick it up out of thin air that has no association with anything that's really another thing cool. right and the, the, well, the holiday we'll get to i'm not even up to the holiday i'm up to the idolatrous seemingly very obvious uh, symbol of idolatry that we don't do. If he wanted to draw the people away from Shalayim, which he, it says on the level of shot, that's what he's trying to do. Why don't you think of something else? Like, why don't you just, I don't know, I'm going to make something up now. It's going to sound crazy. Why don't you take a box and put a Torah scroll in it and put it in the front and then in front of it, have an altar and have a menorah. And why don't you make a little incense altar while you're at it and just announce, this is where we go to shul now. Like he, he literally built an object that shall not be built. It just seems so crazy. Uh, Linda, you were waiting patiently. Go ahead, Linda, please. Linda first and then Helen. Maybe he's looking for new recruits from people in the area, not necessarily Jews. But you know, the Kiruv operation outreach. Yeah, yeah, outreach because in a healthy way, right? Because they're they're going to need uh, men. They're going to need soldiers and and uh, fighters. There's there's so he's, uh, a he's, lot of he's uh, making class. a pact with other with other nations, other cultures. And by the by, Linda, to your line of reasoning. If the problem during Shlomo HaMelech's reign at the end of it was the import of all sorts of idolatrous cultures, right? Hundreds of them. And it's saying, at least on the level of Pshat, which again, I don't, I don't think should be read literally. Hazal certainly didn't read it literally. Even on the level of Pshat, if it were literally true, then wow, Shlomo got away totally scot-free, right? But it does say that Shlomo worships idols he built or that he's building, you know, things for Kamush and all these uh, disgusting idols, this vile, repulsive culture, and he's sort of abetting it, right? So now maybe Yeravah Menavad is saying, look, 
I'm not telling you to literally bow down to this, but maybe I have to make some kind of compromise. Ba'asher him sham, that's where the people are and the surrounding cultures who maybe we need. And that would also, by the way, I like your theory a lot, kind of explain why it's up and done in a border region, because there are other peoples up there and maybe they'll come and worship. And when they come and they see it, they'll realize, oh, you know, but there's this altar we're sacrificing to God, right? Now, later on in Jewish history, by the way, no question, people were like bowing down to this thing, like bad things were happening, terrible bad things. But at least at this moment, it's, it may be less clear. That's a great point. Thank you. Uh, Helen? Okay. Did the first ego fashion itself? It wasn't fashioned by a sculptor's hand. It fashioned itself. There, there, there is a measure that describes, based on the ambiguity of the, of the, of Perak Chaf Bet, Alamed Bet, excuse me, and Shmot. I'll show you in a minute. We're going to look it up together. That yeah. There's a matter that says that, like, they threw the gold in and it popped out that way. So, you know, that just shows that it was meant to be. Um, well, maybe that's worthy of discussion maybe consideration. He used that, yeah, yeah, that he used that. And maybe there's something to this enigmatic uh, appearance by itself. And maybe that's why he used yeah. that symbol. Maybe. And my Bubba used and my Bubba used to say, be careful, Iber the Grenitz. Whenever you're going into an area, Iber the Grenitz, watch out. So he's oh. going by the border. And border towns usually have a bad day. Okay. Could be. Could be. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Gene, you're waiting patiently. Gene, over to Gene. Yeah, Rabbi, uh, two things. One. All the other uh, cities were further south. If he's trying to make it so that people can get to these altars easily, the people in the north now have a place to which they can go and arrive with, with relatively little time. So that may have been part of the thinking of why up north and Don as well as- He added a convenience factor. Yeah. Convenience factor. It's something just that simple. Look with me on the screen. Mm -hmm. You got it. Look just on the screen, right? I just finished telling you that Ephraim and Manasseh are here. Well, who's down here in Yerushalayim and farther south? Fairly yeah, obviously down. not the kingdom of Yisrael. So if he wants to be the northern kingdom, Here's in Beit El. So anybody who's here on the way to Yerushalayim, oh, you stop off in Beit El. Now you already davened. Can't daven twice. You exhausted your chiv in Beit El. But if you live anywhere, you know, past the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Shechem uh, line, your, your latitude is uh, higher than the Shechem parallel. So what happens when you go farther north? Well, wouldn't it be more convenient if I could just go to a worship center closer to my home? Or maybe it's the same distance, six, one, half a dozen, the other, but it's, it's very nice, less mountainous, maybe. Uh, well, it's not true, really, over here. But you get to Amic Israel, et cetera. You can keep going up. You know, this is very beautiful. It's very lush. If you've ever been there, even in the summer, a lot of water flowing. It's easy to walk that area, right? And you're drawing the people away from a focus on Yerushalayim. You're making about up the bookends, Beit El and Dan, on two sides, the north and the south and actually also one, one over the Jordan. So you have that to consider. Um, so thank you for that. That's a great point. Anything the else, Gene, or can I pass over to play to Shelly again? Well, I was just gonna add that in, in those days, worshiping a calf was very common among the Semitic different peoples in the area. And that could have been why he chose a calf, just ignoring Jewish history this was something that was familiar. And to Linda's that, point, it would be something that would be attractive to other yeah. nations in the surrounding environs. Yeah. Yeah, well said. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Linda, Linda set it up for you. It's Linda gets the credit for setting it up, but that's, that's, that's the idea. We're going to bring in... Beautiful. I love it. Okay, Shelly, one more point, and then I got to move to the next uh, section okay. over here. Because I see I'm Gamora's. wondering why... Um, Remember, before, uh, even at the beginning of Shlomo, there's bum out. Everybody's going to uh, doing the bum out. So yeah. even Shlomo, in the beginning, before the Beit HaMikdash is built, 
sacrifices to God on, on some place. Okay, so there's only 40 years of Shlomo, so there's still the tradition of the Bumot. Why, sure. how does that fit in? He's making these two big things which are basically like the Beit HaMikdash on both parts of the country. Why doesn't he just say, you can go to your, go back to your bum out. Or does he say that? Does to my point exactly that I was saying before. That's what makes this so mind boggling. That's what I was just saying before. Let him take a beautiful box, decorate it, put a safer Torah in it and say, this is something you've never seen before. It's called a Beit Knesset. And you can, God is everywhere. Want to access Hashem in your Beit Knesset. You have to go to Yerushalayim, right? Come to my Beit Knesset, exactly. And he could have had the Bamot, which as, you, as you're quite right, it's 40 years. It's not like it's, uh, it's in living memory for everyone. Think where you were 40 years ago. Everyone has a living memory if you're, if you're over 40 something. You remember what happened 40 years ago? Okay, 40 years ago, right? But he inserted the, the, uh, the, the Eglay Zahav and it makes it so strange. So if you look with me at the Gemara here on page, uh, on the source sheet over here, Amrav Nachman, Gossad Ruch, Shahaya Babi Yeravam, Tir Datomina Olam. He had uh, haughtiness. There was something about him. It was like over the top. As it says, Shinama Vayamrava Yerov, Am Bilibo, he said to it in his heart, At Tashuva Mlacha, Beit Davidim Yala, Amazet, Lasus Vachm Vedashim Bishalim, Bishavli, Amazel, Adonayim, El Rahava, Melch Yuda, Baharaguni. Exactly your point, Shali, from before. They'll come kill me. Everyone, they're going to keep going back. Amar. So he said the following. Gemiri, we have a received tradition. Rashi says, Only the kings of Yehuda may sit in the Beit HaMikdash. Once they see that Rechavam uh, is sitting and I'm standing there, they will be of the opinion, Hamalka, Ha'avda, they will very quickly revert to saying who's the real king? He who sits in the Beit HaMikdash. Who's the fake king? The one who does not sit in the Beit HaMikdash. Who's standing? V'yativna, if I stand, morid b'malchut avai, they'll say I am a rebel. The Katlin and Leva azlu batre, and they'll kill me. Even though I have widespread support in 10 tribes, the imagery will be too shocking, and they'll just, they'll kill me right then and there, by the by. Maybe Malchut Yehuda's people will kill him because they outnumber everybody else because they're the locals. Maybe even the people from Malchut Yisrael are there will realize, what are we crazy? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go against Hashem? No way. So the, and they'll go back. They'll kill me and they go back. And exactly what you said before, Shelley, mob mentality happened to uh, this poor fellow, uh, the, the guy in charge of the taxes. Right? They killed him. Didn't take too long. So, right? If uh, uh, Adoram lost his life just like that. I'll also be killed. So what did he do? Miyad, My vayivat. What does it mean that he took counsel? So listen to this. Amarav Yehuda, Shoshiv Rasha Eitzel Tzadik. He put the Rasha next to the Tzadik. What does that mean? According to some, means he somehow in the Sanhedrin Agado, he stacked the deck. He put a wicked person near a righteous person, but he had them seated next to each other. Amailuhu. He said to the Sanhedrin Agado, Khatmitu al Kola Davdina, are you going to sign on everything that I've been doing? Amrule, they said to him, Hin, yes. We, we agree. We assent. Amailu, he said to them, Malka, but you know, have I want to be the king. Amrule, Hin. They agreed. They assented. Do you accept everything? Will you do everything that I say? I found the king. They answered him, Him, yes. Said he to them, even to worship idols. Right? The righteous who was sitting in the Sanhedrin Agadol the, the one tzaddik, the many tzaddik, and whatever you want to say, but those who were righteous said, what? Chas v'shalom. Never, heaven forbid. Amalei Rashi, the tzaddik, the Rashi said to the tzaddik, salkadaitach de gavrik yirav an palach lavodazar. Do you think a person like Yeravim is actually literally going to worship idols? It's bluster. It's talking points. It's a guzma. It's an exaggeration. El minasnin hu hu de kabai. He is testing us. 
He wants to see our level of loyalty. Will we follow him into the fire? Will we worship idols? And of course, everybody knows we don't worship idols. That's so ridiculous. Therefore, we're being asked if we would go that far as a loyalty test. I'll keep going in the Gemara, and then we'll discuss, did this literally happen? He literally went to the Sanhedrin. They literally gave him this license, and he asked them this question, and the Rasha said to the Tzaddik, ah, it's just a loyalty test. Let's just play along. Rashi here says, right? Amr lo Rasha lo Tzaddik. Essentially, you want to know if our heart, our mind is totally with him. So the Tzaddik was appeased. That's how the Russia fooled or somehow caused the Tzaddik to make a mistake. So until everyone signed, and uh, they no longer could go, could go back. Now, if you take this Gemara literally, what it seems to mean, what it seems to mean is that Yeravam ben Nevat somehow had, what is it exactly? A council of sages? Is it possibly even the Sanhedrin Haggadol? It's some group of tzaddikim somewhere who are some kind of a council, clearly to the king, my vayivaats, he put a tzaddik next to the Russia, right? Um, and uh, he got some kind of uh, agreement from them that he should be the king. Now, are these the sages of Yisrael? Is it the people in Yerushalayim? We don't know exactly. It doesn't tell us. But what it does say is that a lot of righteous people seem to have signed on. Shelly, I got to finish the Gemara first. Sorry. Gemara, top of the next page. I'll come back to you. Don't worry. Just, just give me a minute. Va'af, and these are the most chilling words of them all. Even the Rabbi of Eliyahu Hanavi, even the one who said to Yeravim ben Nevat, you're going to be ruling, he made a mistake. Even he signed on the writ. Now, later on in Jewish history, much later, we don't have time already to see it inside, but you can look it up for yourself. It's in Malachim Bet, chapter 10, verse 18 and onward. Is the story of, I'll tell you very briefly, of Yehu, Yehu, who is the successor essentially to Achav and Izevel, Yehu, who does engage a partial tshuva movement. Deha Yehu Tzadikaya Rabahava. He was actually a great tzaddik, the Gemara says, quoting the Psukim. You'll have four generations that will come as a dynasty from you. Um, and yet, later on, it says, He did not move away from that which were the sins of Yeravam ben Nevad, who caused Jewish people to sin. My gar- garmale, what caused him to do this? Uh, there, there is a covenant that goes over the lips. Yehu, give you the backstory very briefly outside, created a ruse. He wanted to destroy the culture of Baal of Achav. So he made a big public proclamation. Achav worshiped the Baal a little bit. I'm going in, you could say. I'll use the term advisedly, whole hog. So he called and invited every Navi, quote unquote Navi, of the Baal, every Kohen of the Baal, every adherent of the Baal to a great jamboree. And when they arrived, they performed their idolatry. And then he turned to his guards and he said, kill them all. And all were killed. And this was a great moment of tshuva. And this was amazing. But a couple of psukim later already, what does the Navi describe? But he never got rid of the two golden calves. And therefore he followed the Egel, he followed the, the sins of, of Yeravam ben Nevat. So Abaye says, you know, how did he fall so fast from, he killed off the Nevi'a Baal, it's amazing, to the next step was, and he didn't get rid of the sins and he continued the same sin of Yeravam who caused the Jewish people to sin.
right? How could that happen so quickly? Abaye says, because he shouldn't have spoken as he spoke. He made a big mistake. The mistake was that he even said something, even though it was a ruse, but the fact that he made that proclamation, you could say like this, even after the Nevei Habal were killed, the reality was that the posters were still lying, were still, the Pashkavilim was still on the walls and still on the garbage. And a couple of people took him home and they made it a slogan. And that's why Baal is still around later on. V-Day, no, the culture of Baal is not gone completely after that. It's weakened, but it's not completely gone. Rava disagrees. Rava says, you know what the problem was? You know why he's, he, he, he didn't take care of the, I mean, once he's rooting out of idolatry, why didn't he just take care of the two golden calves, be done with it? Rava says he saw a particular signature of the greatest guttle of the generation of the Rebbe of Elio Anavi signed on that writ uh, that gave legitimacy to Ravan ben Avat, and that was a Chiyash Shiloni, who had made his mistake generations earlier, but the consequence was still playing out. The next piece also, V'shachata shatim ha'emiko v'ni musar l'kulam, Amar Rav Yochanan, Amar Kosh Baruch Hu'eim ha'emiko mishali, they made it worse than I did. Who's they? Probably in the time of, uh, not of Yehu, but in the time of Ravan ben Avat, Ani Amarti Hashem says, I said, Kosha in a Ola Regal over Baasei. If you don't go up to Shalayim, you're over in an Asei because it's a positive mitzvah to go to your Shalayim, mitzvah of Ali Ola Regal. But hey, remember what they said, Kola Ola Regal, Dakar Becherev. They said, anyone who goes up to the Regal will be, will be killed, will stab them. Will you Dakar Becherev? So, in other words, that was, that was really horrific that they created this ban, et cetera. So, we're really left with this question, though. And, you know, this gives us a, an idea. Again, was it actually the, 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 the Sanhedrin Agadol? Like they fell for this? And if they did, then why didn't Rechavim get rid of Sanhedrin Agadol? Because this is sedition. They signed on with them, right? And Achia Shiloni, according to this Gemara, signed on with them. You know, the point is, there was a case to be made. And if you have allegiance to the king, you follow him into the fire. That's what it means. Otherwise, you don't really trust me. And what they thought was just a ruse maybe actually came true because he said, I guess, again, according to this Gemara, the point is they had signed. So now they were stuck. And now he actually made two, two golden caps, but he showed everybody, look, they all signed. They all told me I, they, they would follow me. So that's what I want. And I'm the king. But it's a more complicated landscape, obviously, much more complicated landscape. If you look up uh, chapter 32 in Sefer Shmot, which we will do, it's very brief. It's a long chapter. So we don't have time to see every aspect of it. Shelly, you want to ask your question while we're flipping to say for Shmot? Two points. One yeah. is the problem with Midrashim is sometimes later on they don't fit with something else. And there's always been the Midrash that Shevet uh, Yisachar in, in his partnership with the Zvulun is this, these wonderful scholars. Talk I lost you. I can't hear you anymore. Wonderful scholars, but I don't hear the rest. Shelly, we lost you. Say again. Some problems. Computer problems over there. Want to try one more time? Yeah. Okay. The other, the other yeah. one is with, with Yehu. At the same time, you've got Italia in the Southern Kingdom. So if he gets rid of the uh, of the stuff at Beit Eil yeah. and down, to go yeah. down to, uh, the, there, they're still worshiping Baal there. They're basically not doing that, anything. That's an off-ramp. Yes. You're in Malachi Bet with me, but I'm not going there. I didn't open that book, but you're right. But but I'm not going to open that up. But yes, I said already, the culture of Baal was not entirely eradicated. That's what I meant. I just dressed it up as the, the posters are still on the wall. And that is what he said, even though it turned out to be a ruse. But some people did take the message. Wow, we should really go whole hog, you know, in, in for, for idolatry. And that was that was a horrible disaster. Page uh, 102 in the Koran Tanakh, Shmot, chapter 30, uh, 32. Um, we learn uh, that uh, the people make a golden calf. Uh, right? Rashi right there. Elohim They wanted many gods. It's idolatry. Bad things. According to others, though, it was not necessarily idolatry because they say we want an Elohim, which means an, a Lord. L O R D doesn't have to be a capital L. Could be they want the Lord. They want a Lord from the house of Lords. Maybe they want a leader. They want someone who's going to be their judge to lead them. And for this man, Moshe, who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. They all participate, etc. 
right? And here's the Pasuk that came up, um, that um, uh, um, Helen referenced about the eagle popping out, right? So, Vaikach mi Adam, Vayatsar oto bacheret, Vayasehu megal masecha, Vayomer ele elohech Israel, Asher elucha meeret mitzrayim. Sorry, it's not that Pasuk. I made a mistake. That Pasuk actually makes it sound like actually they did make it into, uh, the, he got the gold and they made it into a, uh, a golden calf. And then they announced, these are your Elohecha, Israel. Does it mean your gods? Koren thinks gods, but it could be, this is your Lord that brought you out of Egypt. Literally, they actually thought this is a replacement for Moshe, or do they think this is the new flag? It's a new emblem. It's a representation of something and it's telling them something. And again, as Gene had pointed out, you know, in the ancient Near East, Mesopotamia, maybe that's part of the culture of idolatry. Maybe that's what they were up to. Maybe. Maybe there's symbolic import to a calf specifically having to do with imagery that they knew, the mystical imagery about the god, the god, godly chariot, the Masa Merkava, that's described in Sefer Yechezkel, and the, it's drawn not by horses, maybe, but by calves. And if that's true, well, then maybe that's what they're making, et cetera, et cetera. And you have sources in Sefer Shmot. We're not going to go farther into it because I got I want to keep us localized to Malachim Aleph, but we'll see what the Mepharshim do with it. And this opens a whole discrepancy also about these two Agalim. Because if the people didn't actually worship idols, maybe, maybe that's not exactly what happened, right? By the by, just to close the, the loop with what I said to Helen before, chapter 32, verse 24, Moshe has come down, he smashed the luchot, and he says to Aaron, what happened? Aaron explains, I said to them, who has gold, take it off and give it to me. We, they threw it, I threw it into the fire, and this egel emerged, which makes it sound like either supernaturally, it's like a mice satan, or it came out and people looked and said, wow, that kind of looks like a calf. And then they did the fine tooling to make it more look like a calf. Whatever it is, that's where the measures it's sourced on that possibly it's a that. Larry had a question or comment before we move ahead. Go ahead, please. It, it's on the, yeah. the text in Shmot, uh, Pasuk Dalit. What yeah. basis is there to say it's, it's singular God rather than in two places it's Rabim? It's it's it, it's 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 not. Aleph implies plurality. Elohecha uh, makes... is in the plural, right? Yeah. Elucha that brought you up, plural. Plural. So how how can it ever be a chid? It could only be it could uh, it could only be a chid if we play with the language. Okay, and we thank claim you. that it's the royal, and it's, we could claim it's the royal we. That's a push. Yeah. Okay, let's, no, let's, the, 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 it, it, as primitive as they might have been, and don't forget, these are the people who are very shortly going to, you know, they, they just heard from a Kodesh Baruch Hu, and this is the Dordea. So this is like actually a, on a certain level, spiritually, they've, they've come to a very high level and they're plummeting over here, right? Total loss of cabin pressures, a collapse. But they actually thought now there's a golden calf, that's Moshe. This is what took them out of Egypt. A little fishy, right? A little hard to, hard to grasp. Okay, I lost I, the screen over here, which is not a good thing because I got I want to still want to show you the uh, the source material. So I don't know what you. happened over here. Kind of conked out on us. Okay. Oh, I think it's just my connection went bye bye. Maybe we can get it back. Okay, maybe yes, maybe no. Oh, are they playing with the electricity in the other room because they're building the cubicles? Oh no, it came probably back on. Give me one second. We're we are trying to make a go of it. For some reason, I don't fully understand. We're once again in the. Uh, in the strangeness of some kind of a, uh, oh my goodness, Samsung TV Plus, no, no, uh, this is not, oh, there we are, no, no, <laughs> we're gonna have to do something to fix this because I can't, I can't handle, not, it's 1940s films on, um, no, doesn't seem to be working. Oh, Shine, I got it to work. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Uh, Larry, do you still have a question or comment? Can I take Shoshi while we're while I'm trying to get this hooked up again? Shoshi, go ahead. Okay, so as we're reading this, then it starts to form in my head that here they are coming out of Mitzrayim. They're really fresh, 
new scared. You know, they're in transitional time. Rabbi Friend, I think, talks about transitions in the Israel. That's when they do their hot time, right? This week's Parsha. In other words, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, first don't put a new box over here. Yeah. Okay, right. So they're it's transitional. That's what the point is. And that's when they're the most vulnerable. And so all of a sudden, they throw their gold in. They're scared. All of a sudden, what appears in front of their eyes is two. I loved what you just said, Larry. It's Rabin. There's multiple kids. And then he goes, Rabin takes that concept and builds himself those two. Look at this is what it is. You know, they couldn't see Hashem. They were too afraid to hear Hashem, right? It was too scary. This they could handle. This they could put their hands on. Okay. We have to see. Look with me on the screen. Let's let's look at some sources. The Radak. He was looking for an Eitzah, what he should do. And they agreed. All the people agreed. According to the Radak, they were the, the Yoatzim were the ones who gave him the idea. Right? So he, he came to them and he had a case. He said to them, you know that the kingdom was now split with God's assent. He agreed. As Achia uh, Shilani, sitting right here, told me. In Cain, Ha'el lo ratzav malchut beit David, lo ratzav gankin berushlayim shehu malchut beit David. And this is a crucial point, is that even when Shlomo was being told there'll be a punishment, Rechavam in his day, there'll be a split, again and again, we don't have time to go see it anymore, but we did harp on this point, Yerushalayim and Malchut Beit David actually stays. But Yeravim told them, no, this is a rejection, not just of Rechavam and a temporary measure and a split that's uh, a contingent, it's actually for all time. And it's actually because God is done with Malchut Beit David and he's done with Yerushalayim because that's the place where David and his people live, or the descendants. So therefore, let's make another place that you will offer there. Now, why an Egel? Didn't Aaron make an Egel for the Jewish people? Now, according to Radak, excuse me. So the point for Radak, the point of the Egel was as a stand-in for Moshe, in as much as Moshe was the person who caused there to be a Shechina that dwells in the midst of the people. Why did they think that? Very simply, because they told Moshe to be that person. Don't you remember? They're all hearing from Hashem. They say to Moshe in chapter 20 of Sefer Shmot, you be the go-between. So what's the Shechina associated with? Moshe Rabbeinu's presence. This is wrong, but this is what they thought, right? And, and it's, it's, it's Moshe more than everyone else. Now there's no Moshe. We need something else that could be the Wi-Fi receiver. I just made that up right now. The Wi-Fi receiver. So we need a new one. So what do we got? Let's build an let's build an object. Happens to be an egel. Now, Nasa Egel Bim Kombo, La Hashra Shinabo will make the Egel to be in his place. So the Shina will dwell within it. Not because we're going to worship the calf, we're going to worship the divine presence. The object is going to be the receiver, basically. Right? Radak has this idea. Ibn Ezra quotes this idea from Yudah Levi. Right? And Ela Elohech, Asher Luchem Eretz Mitzrayim, means we're talking about Hashem. Kemosh Amar Be'egel Hamidbar, Kilo Aita Kavanatu Lavod Gilulim. It's not literally that it, 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 it was idolatry. Vlama Asa Shnaim, why two? Kedesh Lo Atriach Yisos Shevo Kum Lamakom Echad. They shouldn't have to come to one place. So let's make it more convenient. Hashem is here. Hashem is there. Hashem is truly everywhere. Signed, Yeravim Ben Nevat. But you could have just as easily put, Uncle Moishi or Moishi Rabbeinu or whoever, because that's a slogan we believe in. Shem is everywhere. So much is he everywhere. Look, I don't need a single worship center. I need multiples. Radak thinks it was not about idolatry then in the Torah, and it's not really about idolatry now either. A Barbanel quotes, Vayiven Yeravim the Gomer, Siperakatush Yeravim, Acharishim Ach Yisrael, Banat Shechem Bahar Ephraim, it wasn't destroyed. It was the place where they went to go crown Rechavam. It's a Magino line. He built fortresses, one in Shechem, one in Penuel, to make a line to separate out 
Malchut Yehuda, Malchut Yisrael. No one will get past these two places. That's aside from its historical import. Much more dangerous. If they keep going three times a year to go offer offerings, right? When they go, their heart will be shifted over to their original master, Rechav Am. He'll be the real ruler and he'll be the natural king. And when they go there, they'll go against me, Rav Am. They'll kill me and they'll put Rechav Am again in public. So therefore, I have to do this. And they all agreed that they can't allow this to happen. Otherwise, there'll be a conspiracy to kill him, right? And they'll go back publicly to Rechavam, their rightful king. Can't let that happen. Therefore, he got the idea of the Agalim in two places. But here are four questions. The fear of uh, from, from, uh, from um, Abarbanel. One, what was his, per- his point? Number two, Vlama. Uh, north and south because the truth is Yehuda wasn't right across to the coast Yehuda was a canton uh, like it is today it's a canton but it's not the whole thing could have been done in Beersheba north and south and surround them right so how do they agree to that number four you can read in the Separsha Shmot. It's a Parsha Kitis, the for Shmot, what happened. That's the second main question. So, Arch Rationalist Ralbag, as I always call him, the Jewish people were ignorant of basics in Torah. They had a lot of time that they spent eating, drinking, and being merry. How do we know? It says so in Parshat Perak Dalit. Under the reign of Shlomo, there were lots to eat and drink and to be happy about, but they didn't learn anymore. The culture shifted. Now, I'm not claiming, and Rabag is not claiming, that Shlomo deliberately wanted them to be ignorant people. It just sort of grew up that way. The Navi is harping on the point. Yeah, they did fall into idolatry. You know why? Because they stopped learning Torah, because they replaced it. They said, we've arrived. We're done knowing the books, even the most basic story they didn't know. And I always go back to that uh, incredibly tragic description in Yossi Klein Alevi's uh, book, Like Dreamers, a uh, difficult book in many ways, challenging book. What does he describe there when they got to the Kotel? Right? That, that uh, someone turned to one of the uh, clearly religiously observant soldiers and said, what prayer can I say now? And the, what did the Chayal tell him? Say Shema Yisrael. If you don't know a prayer, say Shema Yisrael. What did the fellow say back? Mazeh Shema Yisrael. Mazeh Shema Yisrael. Can you imagine? Mazeh Shema Yisrael. It's in the book. You can look it up right there. It's like, it's staggering. Ayitachin, a person who speaks Hebrew, who grew up in Eretz Yisrael, who's fighting for Yerushalayim, doesn't know Shema Yisrael? It can happen. The Rabbah says, guess what? It happened. Rabbeinu David Kimchi, the Radak said, he said, we saw it already in Radak, so we don't have to read it inside, but basically, same, uh, same deal, right? It was not about Advoda Zara, and by the way, all the Mepharshim agreed, it's not Advoda Zara, uh, the, and, and it was one in Beit El. You know why? It was chosen already, and it was already called the Beit Elohim by Yaakov Avinu. Huh? Now, he does not accept it's not enough. It does not explain why did he make Agalim. Uh, why, why didn't he just bring them away from his from the from Yerushalayim? Make him his bear. What, what uh, was Boing pointed out? Shelley pointed out, others pointed out, right? Make him his bear, offer offerings, make a nice menorah, just like Yerushalayim. Like, what do you have to make Agalim? So now, now, and with Abuchol Am Yisrael, Loyav Shashlin Saish. Yeah, 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 yeah. Most people were maybe ignorant, like Rob Bag says, but come on. There's not one Tamad Chacham, not one person who even knows basics of what happens in the Parsha de Shavuah. And you'll tell me, well, they don't Parsha Shavuah then, Rabbi. Okay, triennial cycle, but they knew. Yeah. They don't know the Jews people don't worship idols. 
היו לשלא יעלו שלים, אבל לא שיזבחו לעגלים. I mean, what he told them was he, he seduced them not to go to Yerushalayim, right? Uh, uh, but he didn't say to them they should worship idols. Vigam Kane, Ani Roe, Shalo Amar Shasi, Ravam, Mizbeach, Lifna Egel does not say that he made, uh, that he told them, uh, that he said to them to make a Mizbeach in front of the Egel. Veloshi Shtachavulo didn't bow to it. Vizavchulo Zvachim, Kemoshin Amar, Bedor Amidbar doesn't say, if you look carefully to this point, does not say they worshiped it. It just says he set them up, he made the declaration, and he was going up there to do stuff. But it doesn't say that all of them came for it. They didn't bow to it. Chapter 13, it's going to be an argument from silence. It's going to be pretty striking. He never, the, the, the person comes to criticize Yeravim Benavat, he doesn't mention the Egels, plural, Agalim. Achia Shiloni, he's a Navi. When he's going to go to HD Ravan, he won't mention it at all. Right? They're going to go after the fact that there's a Mizbeach at all and that he's offering offerings on it. Eliyahu also, Why did these prophets make a big simis out of the issue of the Egels? Of all people, who could you say, and he did it for, for the right reasons, for sure, for, for all for Hashem, but who was incredibly zealous and who you could have said about him in a certain way, in a very positive way in some regard, he didn't have a filter. Elio Anavi, he didn't care what you thought. He's going to tell you what it is. He's going to bring the fire from Shemaim, that's it. So knew he couldn't take care of the Egels. So if you look in the Kuzari, there's a whole business about this also. How did Yehoshaphat, they're asking, how did Yehoshaphat eat from the Suda of Achav? But they didn't say anything about the Yeravam piece. Now I'll show you the, the end point, and then I'll take questions, comments, because this, this opens it up. It can't be that there is a, um, that there, that, you know, the, all of this seems to show that the, the you know, that the, the, these couldn't have been for Avodah Zarah. Someone would have mentioned it. Someone made a, a campaign against it, and nobody does. Not the Isha Lukim in chapter 13 that's coming, not Aliyo, not any of these people. Okay, but let me ask you, if what they were doing had nothing to do with worship at all, so then why do you make Egels? Haim, Haya, Pa'al, Batel, Omas, and Narut, what he did, it just, he's, he's a fool. It's just, just a silly thing that he did. It's not worship, wor related to worship. And because of all this, I think, says the Abarbanel, that Yerovam did not think they should be objects of worship. It was not his thought when he brought, when he built them. And he did not therefore mention, let's bow down to them. He didn't call them godly or anything like that. And again, the argument from silence that nobody takes him to task for this. He doesn't say they bowed to it. They worshipped it. It was not his intention to be for idolatry. But what was it then? So, okay, so then what is it for? They have names. They're called Yachin and Boaz. They're actually mentioned. We don't have time to see it inside. You'll trust me. Go back to the chapters about the building of the Beit, of the Beit HaMikdash. It mentions that he put two massive pillars outside of the main building of the Beit HaMikdash. Why did he do it, Shlomo? To remind everyone about David and Shlomo called the Yachin and the Boaz. This is not scripted. It seems to indicate it's not scripted. And it's a living monument, not an object of worship, to the fact that there is a kingdom and a dynasty. Of course, you should now ask me, well, then why do you make two big pillars? Why do you make one big pillar? Say, we're going to worship one God. So I made one obelisk, right? Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he build a little building or a little doorway and put two pillars on it 
and say, this is my new Yachin and Boaz. It's going to be me and whoever my successor will be. Now, now hear this. This will open it up, uh, hopefully, for today. He needed an image that represented his kingdom. What did Moshe say about Yosef in his bracha to Yosef? The symbol of the tribes of Yosef are an ox, are a bull. What's the symbol of the United States of America? It's an eagle. It's the symbol of the Roman Empire, a wild boar. What's the symbol, the Havdol Feavdolot now, of Shevet Yehuda? It's a lion. Just walk the streets of Yerushalayim. It's everywhere, yeah? Because of Shevet Yehuda. Now hear this. The tribes of Yosef have a symbol. And it's not one symbol, but of necessity, it must be two symbols. Because it's not that Ephraim is greater than Menashe, but Ephraim and Menashe are the two brothers who never fight, who are one, who are united in their common symbol, which is the symbol of Yosef. So therefore, Yosef, <laughs> Why was it of gold? To show that it's eternal. It's the finest of metals. The two pillars were made out of brass. Shehu Hashor. The ultimate animal is the shore. It's not the lion. The lion is the king of the beasts, but it's not possible for it to do work. It can't be domesticated. It can't pull a chariot, but the shore can do that. And the harking back to that symbol of Rivavod Ephraim and Alfei Menashe is right here on display. As is described, the Egel is at the doorway of the house that he built. We call it Bamot, the Beit, whatever he called it there in Beit, in Beit El. He built the Bamot, but it's Beit HaBamot, right? I, I don't have this page open myself anymore. 400 and whatever we said, 420 something, yeah? Yeah, That's, it describes it that way when he built it. It describes it in verse um, in verse uh, thirty. No, verse thirty-one. Vayas it Beit Bamot. So he made a, a building of some sort, and in, it's in Beit El. So at the entrance way, he has an Egel. just like the Amudim when the Petach Ben Mikdash. Ulufisha Eretz Yisrael Gedola, since Israel is very big. Asa Egel Acher v'Nichob Bedan Liyoto B'Ktsei Haaretz K'Dei Shegam Sham Ayazech L'Malchuto. Since people are more impacted by the sensory more than the abstract. It had nothing to do with divinity. He just, just put it up. Is anyone worshiping the bald eagle? Someone bowing down to the line of Judah? So therefore he made in that place a Mizbeach in Beit El. That's where his throne was. And another one in Dan. Exactly as they did. Yeah? Okay? Now. Means to worship God. Mizbech's for God. The Egel, that's, that's to remember who the king is. That's his symbol. Uh, you could say that maybe he made two because of the two differentiated locations, right? Aval right? But 
but actually, right, or maybe rather, he made these two as against Ephraim and Asher. These are the two tribes from the house of Yosef. And he was testifying that the Bechor was given to Yosef and Malchut goes to him and not to Yehuda. And indeed, Amaro, Hinei Elohecha Yisrael, Asher Luchem Eretz Mitzrayim, Ein Rai Ui, Shia Furash, Al HaGalim, Kemosh Amru Dor Amidbar, it's not appropriate to translate this to have it to do with the with the golden calves. These are that which brought you up. These are your gods. Who do you speak to? Israel. It's too much for you to go to Yerushalayim. Meaning, it's a long way, and it's a, a great struggle to try to get there. Or maybe it's uh, it's too much like Rave Yitzro. There's going to be a, something, Jotro, is a quarrel to do that. So and he was saying this about Rechavam, meaning after you already rebelled against him, Rav Lachem, you're going to make a reeve, a fight to go up to go see him. Can't do that. He'll kill you if you go. So what did he do? He spoke to their hearts. And he told them another thing. He said, As if he said, don't think God is only Yerushalayim. You think the Kruvim are God? Well, they're not God either. Again, the theme song, Hashem is here, Hashem is there, which is a true statement. But here, that's the twist. God is everywhere. The same God who took you out of Egypt, is with us right here. The Einam HaKruvim HaOmdim B'Beit HaMikdash. It's not the Kruvim, of which there are two, mind you, in the Beit HaMikdash, which everyone is facing towards. Ulefizeh lo nemar shehelucha ala agalim, ki im al Hashem anichbad. It was about God. Vayik she amaro elo kecha heelucha belashen rabim. Larry, your question, that it's in the, in the plural. Ki chen derech hagatuv. Sometimes that is exactly the language that's used even in the Torah. Look in Dvarim Perak Dalit. It says, Umi goy gadol asher lo Elohim krovim elav. Who is a, 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 a nation that is great? This is how you translate it from a traditional perspective. Moshe Benu, who just is about to say to people, Shema Yisrael, Shem Hashem Lekem Hashem Echad. So he doesn't mean there's a multiplicity of gods, chas b'shalom. He knows what's in the Aserat Adibrot, which is in chapter five, repeated again, say for Dvarim. And chapter six is the Shema. But he says, who is a great nation that has God close to it? Yeah, so that that's sometimes the Al Barbanel says the syntax, even with regard to Hashem, it's rare, but sometimes the syntax is in the Lashon Rabim. You'll say to me, well, that's a pretty fishy time to say it right here after you made two golden calves. But I would argue in favor of the Abarbanel, there's an appropriation of the language from Cheta Egel, but you see in the contrast of what he, Yeravim, was trying to do. They're essentially saying to them, we're going to make a tikkun on Cheta Egel. And we're going to realize that whatever was happening then was wrong, but now we're going to do it right. We're not bowing to this. It's just a symbol of the kingdom. And the same way you know that there are flags here and flags there and emblems and animals representing the hind that runs and the snake that bites. These are all different tribes, right? It's Naftali, it's Dan. So what am I? What are we? We're the ox. We work hard, we're productive, we're the leader of all domesticated beasts, we have great fury when it's necessary, right? And you know what we're going to do with these oxen? We're going to offer them to Hashem. We'll offer bulls as part of the korbanot. We'll elevate it, because we know we don't worship these things. Larry, had a question or comment? Uh, in all due respect to the Ralbag. This is the Barbanel uh, we're reading now. Ralbag was earlier. I'm sorry, the Abarbanel. Uh, there's an enormous difference, particularly because of the history between an ox and a calf. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that, that's, a glaring, yeah. that's a glaring problem with what he has to say, right? That's a exactly. glare, it's a, glare, a, glaring, a glaring issue, a glaring issue. Um, and um, uh, yeah. Um, so, it, you know, when, when, you, when you just see the next line of the Abarbanel, he says, the truth is, that wasn't his intention, but the, 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 road, the road to Avodah Zarah was paved with good intentions. 
eventually well, it did become an object of a vote of Zara. And why, why would he make calves? Why do you make oxen, grown up oxen? Plus, you know, Aaron instigated the Egel. His intention was favorable. Uh, the history is very troubling, and and the Abarbanel, I, I'm, in all due respect, I just, okay, thank you. You do not have to accept the Abarbanel's approach. The Malbim, we really, in the end, don't have too much time to see. The Malbim did I not assure agree. you, he hasn't accepted mine either. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Um, yeah, yeah. You don't have to uh, agree that thoroughly. Yeah, yeah, no, listen, but your, your point is still well taken. And uh, I'm just saying part of the dialogue among the Mufarshi Mikra is such that, and we're not dealing with matters of Allah, like Allah Psuka, the Abarbanel himself has to admit, yeah, eventually to become idolatrous, right? The people were just so sunken into this that you find out that in the end, you know, there is going to be criticism against these people. It's like ridiculous that they're still going down for idolatry. And he gives other examples where the people slid into idolatry. And it was, it was terrible. And, um, um, you know, that, 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 that's what it means. I'm skipping down to the bottom of the Barbanel. Ba'al zeh derech amar bekan ba'yeh devar azil chatat eventually did become a great sin. She is super machin as achreichen behemshech hazman lo bekavanat the siyatam. It was not the original intent, but, you know, that's that's what happened. So, you know, that that that's where he led them down this primrose path, and it was terrible. The Malbim, who we don't have time to see, but maybe we'll pick it up next we learn, which will be in a few weeks from now. I'll tell you the schedule in a minute. But the Malbim disagrees. The Malbim thinks, no, it, it was for idolatry. For sure it was for idolatry. And, um, and uh, I don't agree. He, he, he breaks down the Abarbanel's arguments and he has his own uh, idea, which we don't have time for already today because we are totally out of time. We will be picking up the learning again, fear not. But the next two weeks, we will not have a shear. The last week in... Um, the last week in the month of July, we'll be back. So not the 14th, not 21st, the 28th, the 29th day of Tammuz, of Badlin and Latova. God willing, we will have a shear again. Let's use the time to review, to think a little, to imagine, to uh, whatever it is. And uh, we'll get together, God willing. Uh, you're welcome to join me in person, me and Phil right here, or alternatively to come back on Zoom either way. Uh, wish everyone a great day and great continued learning. Thank you for joining.